Um, the next talk will be actually a code tutorial from Daniel, which was previously introduced by um, Nick Lane. Um, and Pietro, who's a postdoc at the University of Cambridge and currently working on distributed learning systems and helping uh, develop Flower, actually. So, um, yeah, go ahead, guys. So, thank you. Um, in my talk earlier today, um, there was a claim that Flower is easy to use and makes it easy to federate existing um, uh, pipelines, existing um, machine learning workloads. And with that session, we want to get a bit more practical and support some evidence for that claim. So let me share my screen with you and um, introduce um, uh, a basically a, a the easiest um, TensorFlow Hello World that you can do. This is actually um, from the TensorFlow um, Hello World example, um, a, a plain copy. So um, what we can see here is, first of all, um, it implements, um, it imports TensorFlow. We then um, load the data set, which in this case is MNIST. Um, we define a very simple um, sequential model with dropout. Um, the model is then being compiled with the atom optimizer um, and um, the proper loss function. And um, then we do a model.fit to train the model. Um, and after training, we evaluate the model with a model.evaluate. So um, let me share the console now um, and show you how this looks like um, when we train it. Um, uh, so we start this file. Um, it takes a few seconds for TensorFlow to initialize and show a couple of warnings, but then we can see how the training kicks off and um, how the accuracy um, improves. So um, we are at 85% um, accuracy roughly um, after, after round one, um, after epoch one. We're then going into the next epoch. Um, we are training for three epochs in total. So now epoch two is finished um, with about 95% um, accuracy. Um, and we are now in the third epoch. And after the third epoch is finished, um, we evaluate the final model on, um, on the test set. Um, let me share. VS code again. Um, if I find the right button. There it is. Okay, you should now be able to see um, both VS Code um, and my um, and the terminal. Um, so we understand how this very simple um, TensorFlow Hello World example works, um, and we now want to federate um, this thing with with Flower. So let me bring in some um, additional um, lines of code. Um, so if we want to federate an existing pipeline um, with Flower, we begin obviously by importing um, FLWR as FL, which is the canonical way of importing flower. And then what we do is um, we implement um, something called a client, um, the flower client. And the easiest way to implement a flower client is by extending class NumPy client. So NumPy client is a convenience class that makes it easy to implement flower clients that um, serialize um, and deserialize their weights um, into NumPy and the arrays. And um, defining a NumPy client um, requires you to override um, three methods. Um, the first method is get parameters. Um, get parameters basically returns the local model parameters. Um, and it's quite easy to implement um, because Keras offers a, a very nice convenience function called get weights which returns the model weights um, as a list of NumPy and the arrays. So to implement get parameters, we just call model.getWeights. We then have um, method fit. Method fit um, basically receives the parameters from um, the server, and then it uses these parameters um, to train them on the local data. So what we do is we update the model 
with these parameters that we received from the server. So we call model.setWeights, which is um, works um, pretty much like model.getWeights, just the other way around. Um, so we set the weights on the local model. We then take the model.fit call that we had earlier, that we've seen earlier, and move it right after model.setWeights. So we have it here. Instead of doing three local epochs, um, we decide to just do a single local epoch. And then that trains the local model parameters on the local data. And then the next step is um, to return these um, refined model parameters that, are, that were refined on the local data. So we call again um, model.getWeights. We could equally well um, call um, get parameters here because that's pretty much the same thing. Um, we also return the length um, of the training data set, so the number of training examples involved, and a dictionary. In this case, the dictionary is empty, but we could um, include custom metrics here if we wanted to track certain metrics um, about the training and return these to the server. Next up is evaluate, um, which is the third and final method that you need to implement. Um, evaluate works pretty much the same way as fit. Just a, the single difference is that it doesn't train the model on the local data, but it just um, evaluates the model. So again, we take the evaluate call that we've seen um, earlier, um, move it down here. Um, after we set the weights, um, we evaluate the model on the local um, uh, test set. And then once we have, um, once we evaluated the model, we just return the loss. Again, the number of um, test examples um, and um, the accuracy. So here you can see one of these um, custom metrics in action. We um, use a dictionary to define a key called accuracy um, and we use it to transfer the accuracy um, number back to the server. And then all that's left to do is to start um, the NumPy client. Obviously, federated learning requires a server and a client or multiple clients. So we're saving the, um, the client. And for server, um, we're just um, calling start server. So that's the, the simplest thing you can do to start a server. And um, now we are attempting to start the server. Um, fingers crossed, um, starting the server. There's um, the first typo. So the server is now starting um, and um, nothing much happens because it's waiting for clients. Obviously the server can't do anything without clients connected. Um, so we'll go ahead and, and start the first client. Same typo here, starting the first client. The client again, takes a few seconds to start to load TensorFlow, um, establishes the connection to the server. So we do see here um, opened gRPC connection, but nothing happens because the server waits um, for a couple of clients to be connected. Um, so let's start the second client. So the second client, again, takes a few seconds to load um, TensorFlow and it immediately starts to train. So let's look at the server log. Um, the server log shows fit round, which means um, selecting clients to train the model. Fit round, the strategy sampled two clients out of two. So two clients are connected and we are sampling two of these. And the round is already finished. So the server received um, two results um, and zero failures. It then does a round of evaluation um, and evaluates on both clients and then does the next round of um, training. So we can see here on client one um, how the training goes. We can also follow client two um, and we can see how the global model um, evolves on the server side. So we configured the server to perform three rounds of um, federated training. And now the server is finished. Um, so we see fit round one um, here. We see the second round here and we see the third round here. Um, and we always see how many results and how many failures we get. Um, because in a, obviously in a distributed systems, client, um, clients can fail um, and not every client might return a result um, every time we instruct them to. 
So in the end, um, we see um, we do an evaluation pass on all of the clients. Um, we can see the output of that here, um, which is pretty detailed. But if we dig into it, um, we see results is a list. And that list contains a result object um, for each client that we had in the workload. One of these um, results objects um, looks like this. We can see the loss that we get from this particular client. We can see how many examples are on that client. And we can see the accuracy, which is 90% um, um, accuracy in that case. Um, same one here. Um, just a few additional comments about um, this example. This is obviously the, the simplest example um, that we can have for federated learning. Um, there are a few things that are not quite realistic. Um, namely, we use the same data set on each client. Normally, what, what we would do um, next is um, we would pass a parameter to start client. Um, and ask the client um, to load a different data set um, for each client ID so that we have different clients um, with different uh, local data sets. And then we can obviously um, start to expand the workload um, in different um, dimensions. We can start to add more clients. Um, we can start to um, optimize hyperparameters. We can start to use custom strategies. Um, and that's something um, that Pedro is going to show you next. Okay, so now let's see how we can go from centralized to federated using Flower and PyTorch. And just to recap, uh, in federated learning, what we have are um, some devices, maybe thousands of devices, each having their own local data set, and they will receive a model from a server that will perform local training on their data set they will then send their um, locally trained model back to the server, and then the server will uh, perform aggregation. And the way we implement this in Flower is by mainly look at, looking at this chart and seeing where we have to insert our user code. So in a regular federated learning scenario with Flower, we just have to define a aggregation strategy, which is the step uh, where the server gathers all the models and to, and to generate one single better model. And also we have to look into the code for training, for the local training. Uh, as you can see, these uh, user codes are shown here in blue, whilst the framework that is already given to you is the light gray uh, part. And again, we are trying in this demo, we're trying to uh, train a neural network to solve the problem of MNIST, of recognizing handwritten digits. So in a centralized code, what you would normally see are a few definitions. One is the definition of the network itself. Uh, two would be the definition of how you're going to load data, how we will load the data the MNIST data in our case. Uh, another definition that you have to give is how you're going to pre you, you're going to train the network. And usually this, uh, this function uh, will define a few loops for local epochs. So you have to give it to it, the, the network itself, a train loader that will load the data, an optimizer that will be performing the actual optimization on the, on the network, a scheduler that will change the optimizer to new hyperparameters. For example, it will reduce the learning rate. Uh, we also have to tell how many epochs we want to, to do the training. And um, we also would like to decide which device we're using, if we're using CPU or if we're using a good enabled uh, GPU. Finally, we can also give a tag for this training process which can uh, be useful to distinguish among um, different experiments. And as a last uh, step, we have a, the definition of the test. So how are we uh, testing uh, how well our model is doing on our local data? So let's see how our model would do in such case. Let's open here the centralized model from the terminal here. 
to make a little bit more space. And here we can see that we have exactly what we said. We have the definition of the network, the layers, and how we do the forward pass. We define how we are going to load data using the standard data sets from Torch Vision. And we return from this uh, load data function, we return train loader and test loader. We also have our train loop the usual train loop that you will see in any uh, torch uh, experiment. You perform the forward pass, you decide uh, what kind of criterion you're using, you perform the backward pass, you take a step with your optimizer and after the entire round you also take a step with a scheduler and here uh, we return a running loss calculated over um, a few batches uh, running accuracy as well since we're using accuracy as a measurement of goodness of fitness in our case and the number of samples that are used in um, in this uh, specific uh, scenario, centralized scenario. We will see that the number of samples is uh, maybe not very useful here in the centralized scenario, but it is very useful um, in the federated learning scenario. And the reason being is that um, since we'll have different clients with different data, we have to somehow give weights to the contribution of, of each one of those devices. So we do this uh, if we use the federated averaging um, aggregation method. We do this kind of weighting uh, with, uh, uh, with the number of samples of each device. Uh, finally, we have uh, the test. And the test basically performs the same forward pass, but it doesn't perform the backward pass and it gives you back um, a l the complete loss, the accuracy, and again, a number of samples, just in case you want to do federated evaluation of your network. So again, you have to weight uh, the returns of those uh, accuracies somehow based on the number of samples. And finally, you see the, the regular centralized main definition. In this case, we will train just for one epoch. takes a few seconds, but then it's done. So we have a test accuracy of 98.27%, which is not bad, but I mean, it is fairly simple. So we were expecting this. Now, when we look into the federated code, we have to define a flower client and here we define we create the class amnest client which will derive from flower client numpy client and when we define this new class we also have to define a few methods for example we have to define the get parameters and this method what this method does is it will get the parameters the, the weights of the network and send them back to the server. We have to define also the set parameters. That uh, is the method that will be called when uh, the server is sending back a, an aggregated model to the device. We have to define how the device is going to perform the local training. And this is done using the fit, uh, fit uh, 
method. And lastly, we also define how we can evaluate the goodness of our, of our model. So we also define a method called evaluate. So if we look closely into the federated average strategy, which is the one that we're going to use here, we can see that there are other options for, uh, for the federated averaging uh, procedure. So the first thing that you, you may want to choose is how many, um, how many devices out of all the devices you have, you want to, uh, to use for training. So maybe you have like one million devices, but you do not want to, to send, use them all for training because that would uh, use a lot of bandwidth in, during communication. So you set a fraction of your or device pool for training. You can do the same thing for evaluation and you can set uh, minimum values for the number of clients that will participate. So this is like a hard decision. So if you, if maybe some devices start uh, disconnecting, um, what is the minimum that you, you're willing to, to use for this uh, federated training uh, not to fail? So you can decide on a minimum fit client, a minimum eval client, and also uh, a minimum available client in total of, um, for, the, for the entire pool of devices. This is basically the number that will, once you've reached this number, you will start uh, with your training. Then if you want to apply a centralized um, evaluation, for example, if you have some data set uh, on, your, on your server that you want to evaluate the aggregated model on, then you can use this eval function, uh, you can pass this eval function to, um, to, to the strategy. Also, you can define a few functions uh, that will be called to configure your uh, fit uh, procedure and you can do this that using the on fit config function which will generate a configuration for your uh, on device uh, uh, fit uh, method and we'll we'll look into this and you can do the same thing for evaluation also you, also you can decide if you want to accept or not fail devices if that will be a uh, um, a valid route And finally, you can decide if you want to initialize the weights with a specific model or if you want just to initialize uh, weights randomly. So now let's uh, see how we can implement this in PyTorch. So first, we look into the flexible server. So basically what you see here are some arguments, mainly the arguments that we discussed previously. And here what we have to do is to complete a few functions. For example, the centralized evaluation, the fit config, and we will run our server after also completing the client. So as I said, uh, the centralized evaluation is used, is used for evaluating on local server data. So to evaluate this, we will also need a model. We will need the test loader we will transform the weights that we have into parameters
we will create a dictionary of these parameters. This is because we need to load them in uh, PyTorch. This is usually how we do it. then load the states we send our model to the device of choice hopefully a GPU Finally, we test on local data. Dictionary where we pass specific words, keywords, centralized accuracy, and the number of samples. Now, with, if we do not want to use a centralized evaluation, we basically ignore this uh, entire uh, entire function and set it to centralize equals to none. And that's it. Now, the other thing that we need to do is to create a function that will give a configuration uh, dictionary uh, to each one of our devices that they will use while they're fitting uh, the model to their local data. And this is done uh, by defining a fit config function. Notice that uh, one input of the fit config function is uh, the round number. So if you want to use any logic that is dependent on the round number, then uh, you can do so here. But in this case, we will uh, not use the round number. We, uh, we will create a, a training schedule um, that will be more or less fixed for, uh, across all rounds. So we create config. And here we define a few things. We define the epoch global. Now the epoch global, it's it can be used. Is not uh, we're not gonna really use in this uh, example, but it's good to keep in mind that maybe uh, not all your devices will be connected at all times. So maybe one device will be connected at round, for example, fifteen, 
and you may choose to use that information, the round information, um, to maybe adapt your scheduler and adapt your learning rate. Epochs. Epochs thirty two, fifty comma thirty eight. Okay, you got learning rate. You're defining how we will change the learning rate in the optimizer. Schedule step hours. So every one round we will decrease our optimizer's um, learning rate. And then we return this config. And that's it. And we're done with our flexible server. Just save. And now let's look into our client. So as we've mentioned, in the client we have to set um, a few things. We have to define the get parameters method, the set parameters method, the fit method, and the evaluate method. So let's start with the get parameters method. So this method will basically um, gather all the weights in the network and generate a NumPy array. Let's CPU. recognize this uh, state dictionary method when you try to save all your um, Python models. State. And that's it for the get parameters, for the set parameters. We do something similar that uh, we did for uh, the centralized evaluation on the server. So we need to get the parameters.
and that's that's it for our set parameters so we get the parameters that came from from the server and we basically transform it into weights for our model we create this state dictionary and as one would uh, load pre-trained models by using the function load state dictionary we do the same with the state dictionary that we just created and finally we have to define how we're going to train our model locally for each device so we do this here so first we call we receive the um, the weights from from the server we call set parameters and the parameters that we receive so we basically call this method here just to update our local model and then we begin with our training now since we want to give more flexibility to our our model we will uh, define a an optimizer every time we we create the the device every time we we, we call this fit function uh, we will create an optimizer and a scheduler based on the configs that we receive from the server so here we can go and create optimizer which in this case we will be using it uh, the delta Since we had defined that the, the centralized evaluation function would give us, uh, sorry, the, the fit function would give us a, a dictionary of configurations, that's what we're using here. So remember that we defined uh, optim learning rate, which is the learning rate for the optimizer. We also define a few important things for the scheduler we'll be using here now so we'll use the step learning rate so the learning rate will decrease uh, geometrically and give it step size Define what is the ratio by which the learning rate will be reduced? That's the gamma. So once we've defined these, we can call our regular train function. Um, that we dis we actually defined in the central light um, uh, version of our of our experiment. So again, we will receive a running loss. We will receive a running accuracy. We will receive number of samples. And we have to pass a few things. Optimizer. And the that box. Okay. 
oh, sorry, in the number of epochs since we are also using the config. We pass none epochs. Less than we need the global variable that defines the device. And if for tags we create a tag based on the client number. So every client will have its client ID, which serves as an identifier that we pass when we create the client. So we also use this as a kind of a tag. And we have to return a response. And our return will be the self. After training, of course, we have to send the parameters back to the um, to the server. So we will call it get parameters. We also need again to send the number of samples and a dictionary of uh, metrics. So here we'll just create one. Again, running loss, just like we did previously. So you always have to send the, um, the parameters and the number of samples. And you usually also have to send the, the loss itself. But then you define the metrics that you, you want, uh, which will depend, of course, on, on the problem you're trying to solve. But since uh, deep learning is always about gradient-based learning, then you, you usually have to send the, the loss. So now that we've done fit, let's look into evaluate. So this is for federated evaluation. So if you had already defined a, um, an evaluation, a centralized evaluation, then you don't need like, really to define anything here. You can put just dummy code. For completeness, let's also uh, define the evaluation. So usually you will set the parameters again. And then you evaluate. So you will get the loss, accuracy, number of samples when you call test sorry. when you call test on your model and you give it a device and of course you have to return these Float, samples, and again, dictionary of metrics. And in this case, we'll just send the accuracy. That's mainly it. What we have here. Oh, sorry, we have to, of course, in our main um, method that will start in uh, each one of the clients, we have to, of course, load uh, the data. We create our 
your model. device we set it to the train mode remember that in PyTorch you have eval and train modes that will set some internal parameters um, they are right if you're doing training so you set you set training then you ignore some temporary parameters when you set to eval and one classic example of that is when you have batch normalization layers and then now you finally have your model you can create your client start your client I'll tell it what the server is which port to connect to and you pass the client object and that's that's mainly it So now let's try and run our experiment. with some minor con corrections in the code. And the fit function works. I think the keys work. And here we see the results of training. So we we have launched first the server, then each client with the respective client ID. And here we can get some log information about how the training went. So, we, so we, here we see some results. We get the losses for the distributed scenario we received, we had two clients, so we received two results, one for each client. And in results, since we used a centralized uh, metric, we have in metrics, the accuracy of 0 0.927, so 98.27%. And this is our result for centralized to federated using PyTorch. Now, in reality, you see this very high accuracy because what we did here is not exactly federated learning. And the reason for that is right here, when we train our models and we load data. So when we are loading this kind of data, we're actually using the original data set from MNIST, which is complete uh, in real federated learning scenarios each device will have their own data set. So we have to account for that as well. So let's talk a little bit about federated data. Open it up a bit more. So in a centralized scenario, we have all the data. Unfortunately, in federated data, um, that's not 
the case. Like real world data is not the case. Every device will have different distribution. And this makes uh, training a model that will fit everyone very hard. So what we, we're doing in Flower is we're giving you uh, the possibility to simulate this uh, non-IAT character of federated learning. So one uh, thing that you can do in cases where you're using classification is to use this function called uh, uh, Dirichlet allocation, which is able to give you to to give you some data distribution from which you will sample your data, uh, and this distribution can range from purely uh, one label data to uniform uniformly distributed data. And you can choose this by turning a single parameter called concentration or alpha. And you can see here for alphas with a very, very small value, you tend to have almost just one label. As you increase the, the size of alpha, you can go up to um, have a distribution that is nearly uniform. So now let's see how you can create partitions of an original data set using what Flower uh, calls create LDA partitions method um, and how we can apply this to this case of MNIST and to regular cases of torch vision classification. So basically if we go here into the code, create LDA partitions, this is a script that has uh, quite a few uh, functions. For example, we have the convert PyTorch dataset to XY, which basically receives a torch dataset and uh, gives out tuples of samples and targets. This is a regular flower dataset where both samples and targets are NumPy array. Uh, and the format is that this is the regular input of your network and is this the, the target that you want to train with. We have the method called partition MNIST LDA because we want to partition the MNIST data set. And what we do is we define the usual transformations for that data set. We create the MNIST data set train and test by calling the original torch vision methods on them. We convert them using the previously defined method convert PyTorch dataset to X and Y. And here we call the flower method create LDA partitions. Notice that in this method, what you pass is the dataset. Uh, you can pass a Dirichlet distribution that you have already created so that you will use that distribution. You define the number of partitions that you want uh, um, your original data set to be divided into. For, and usually this is the total number of devices that you have in your network. Uh, you define the alpha parameter that I talked about previously, uh, which is also called concentrations. And you decide whether or not you want to accept imbalanced uh, partitions. So one benefit of the create um, LDA partitions method returning both the partition and uh, the Dirichlet distribution that it created based on your concentration is that you can use the Dirichlet uh, distributions again when you are partitioning the test set. What does that mean? That means that each client will have the same distribution on their training set and on their local test set. And this is important because you want to, you also always want to verify that your model is doing well on a test set and that the test set also um, mimics correctly your training set. And then we have some helper functions such as uh, load partitions uh, that will help us when we create uh, different clients, we can call the load partition method, giving it a, the client ID. And this client ID will be used to determine where the partition uh, is supposed to, 
to live in your, in your disk. And then we create the regular torch vision um, data loaders from those partitions. So basically you load the partition, they are usually saved. Uh, in this case, we choose to save um, the partitions in a folder structure that will contain the client ID. And then it will have uh, a train.pt uh, file containing all the training data for that client ID and also a, the test.pt file that will contain all the test data for that client ID. We have then to transform them because they are so far in uh, flower uh, dataset type. We transform them so that we can have uh, torch train loaders and test loaders. So you can basically see that the output of this is in the same format as our original load data for um, for example, the centralized training. Okay. So in this case, we can simply create those partitions by calling Python. Oops. And we define Let's use two partitions. Let's keep the alpha equal to 10 as it is and use the default save boot. Okay, now that we have created our partitions, we just have to go to clients and where we used to have our data loader, we change it to load partition. And the load partition will receive our CID the data directory where it's basically the root of our partitions and that's it let's just a few terminals and we run the example. We start the client, the server, sorry. And voila, we trained everything. And here, since it's a more realistic sample, uh, we see that our accuracy did drop a little bit, but that's fine. That's just saying that this is more realistic, but still it's not 100% realistic. And the reason is not only we have different distributions among the classes that we, we use in our devices, we also have different distributions regarding how we generate this data. For example, the way that I write the number two is probably different from the way that you would write the number two. So this also creates some, uh, some problems when you try uh, to train a model. 
And the solution for this problem is to basically use real data. So what we are proposing now is what is called the flower baselines. And the flower baselines is a collection of real data sets where each client is responsible or generates their own data. So examples of real world federated data sets are Amazon review data sets where for some subsets of this data set, we can have more than uh, 30 million reviews. There's also a, a work uh, done by Professor um, Virginia Smith, who is also uh, on our summit today. Um, and this work is called LEAF, uh, which is a collection also of federated learning data sets. Um, and in this new proposed flower database, we are giving you the opportunity of using local data sets, small local data sets, as we just did using Feminist. And we are uh, creating also the, the baselines for larger data sets such as Amazon and Reddit, where instead of loading the model locally, you will be able to connect to a database, select the user that you want to train with and receive data just for that user. So right now we have already implemented Feminist and Shakespeare, and we are currently implementing the appliance subset of Amazon review data and the Reddit part of Leaf. And we hope to have it this as soon as possible to see what you guys come up with, what kind of experiments, large scale experiments uh, in federated learning you guys can come up with uh, using Flower. So here are some resources uh, uh, that, I, uh, that were used during this presentations. I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming up today and have a nice rest of uh, summit. That was great. Um, I think, uh, let, me, let me check. There's one question. Um, it says for pre-processing, for the pre-processing part, there's a normalization step. The mean and standard deviation is calculated for, for the whole train set. Then after normalizing data, it's distributed to the nodes. Um, that's the first question. And the second is each participant to, uh, let me, I think the question is, do the norm, does the normalization step for each participant um, yeah, having uh, with its mean and STD? Yeah. So I guess, I guess I understand the question. Uh, so each device will have a different data distribution. And in the example that we, we saw, we use MNIST for which we know the, the mean and standard deviation. In practice, uh, you, I mean, this question is really, really good. Uh, if in practice, we are not 100% sure how we should deal with this problem. And one, one, um, one way you can try to mitigate this is by having a representative data set of the problem that you want to solve. So if you do have something similar, but you do not have a lot of data and you want to get data from those devices, then you could try and get the mean and standard deviation from your small data set and use it across each device. You could send this to, uh, to each device and ask them to subtract and, um, and normalize um, the standard deviation. Uh, you will see in literature that one of, and one problem that we had uh, when we were working, uh, when we are dealing with uh, federated learning is that layer called the batch normalization layer. Uh, now Flower has implemented a filter that you will either send or not send if you don't want to, uh, the statistics of your, uh, of your batch. And if you think about it, the batch normalization problem is the same problem of mean and standard deviation problem, just in a different layer. So again, uh, it is still a kind of open problem. We, we do not know exactly which is the best way to, to tackle this problem. What was- Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think this is, 
the second one was related to this, right? Yeah, correct. So thanks a lot for the, yeah. for the tutorial uh, to Daniel and you.